Did it say recording started? It did. It's it's got the red light from my end, so I think we're I think we are good. Hello to the people at home. This is contract A for week three, which is capacity. And has, no, it's yes, it is capacity. Um, and we are here to chat about all things capacity related. Um, and generally shoot the breeze, answer questions and have some fun if we can. Um, so just thinking about uh, what we need to do today. What's Maddie's capacity to tutorial? <laughs> do we have capacity this evening? I'm not sure I have capacity. <laughs> I went to bed at one o'clock. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. Um, I will get us onto uh, machine screen. Now, where is my little hmm, documento tutorial notes capacity? There we go. Oh, it's down there. Okay. Can everybody see my document? What I wanted to do uh, first up was to have a bit of, bit of a chat about uh, the principles that we've had to confront this week. Because I know we've, you know, we've gently kind of ramped up our exposure to you know the number of cases that we're looking at each week so um intention to create legal relations was you know there was a fair bit of case law in the text which is useful to get your head around how things used to be done it also got your head around some useful cases that you could potentially um, pop into your answer there but the main case really, wasn't it? It was homogenous. And that was the thing that we had to come to grips with, that, that kind of wild and woolly uh, four judge majority judgment of the High Court. Um, and so this week we're into more of what you'll get to see is the usual kind of contract law week, okay? There is a number of different cases that we need to get our heads around. And generally speaking, it will be the case law that really allows us to flesh out the principles and provide a really good um, answer to the problem questions that are set for us. So before we go and have um, a look at the, uh, the problem facts, what I wanted to do was just check in with you guys and, um, you know, get some feedback from you in terms of um, what you think the principles are so that people's questions will pop up and we can answer them. And then we'll go about teasing out um, an answer to the problem that was um, that was asked of us this week. Okay, so in terms of capacity, why do we need to have it? Obviously, um, historically, the law has been concerned to ensure that the parties actually understand what it is that they're doing. Um, in terms of theory, where does that all fit in then? What why would we need to have capacity? Why would we need to understand what we're doing? Isn't it better if you can find someone that doesn't understand what they're doing and then just contract with them and rip them off? <laughs> Why do we need to have capacity in the grand scheme of things? Think, think large, people. Not live large. Think large. I've got someone saying something to me in the chat. Widespread injustice. Yeah, widespread injustice. I guess that's a nice sweeping, <laughs> sweeping uh, possibility, yes. What's the main, 
the main aim a contract has to be what Free, independent, voluntary, what? So if a party doesn't understand what they're doing, how is this a free, independent, voluntary act? It's not. Okay. So in terms of theory, in terms of the, the bigger question, we need to ensure that we, and you know, all of the major theories um, look at capacity because all, all of the major theories require uh, the parties to know what they're doing in order to exercise a decision and to do it, don't they? So before you can have a contract that's a result of the will of the parties or the promise of the parties or the consent of the parties, they have to know what it is that they're willing or promising or consenting to, okay? So in terms of theory, that's why, that's where capacity slots in. Um, in terms of just pragmatic, uh, you know, consequences if we didn't have the requirement of capacity as who was it Jackson said uh, no Damien um, if there was no capacity requirement you'd have widespread injustice now think about that let's unpack that what do we mean by that what is it the law's job to do with this requirement to stop the injustice. What's capacity designed to do? Uh, so I guess it's, it's designed to uh, ensure, I guess, yeah, particularly the voluntary um, uh, aspect um, all the legal theories talk about our oh, contract has to be uh, voluntarily into, entered into that you can't if you've been tricked or you know um, into something you don't understand you haven't really you, even if you may have agreed to sign a piece of paper or something you haven't really voluntarily entered into that agreement and the whole meeting of minds thing because you've never really been of one mind Yes, and and I noticed that Amy has jumped in there in terms of the uh, the chat box. Adding on to that, yes, it's designed to shore up that whole aspect of, of a contract having to be voluntary and independent and all of that. You have to lock in that level of understanding, don't you? But you also have to... because some people might not necessarily be able to look after themselves and their own best interests. Yes. Yeah. I don't know about that because it's a pretty arbitrary line though. Cause then like it becomes a slippery slope. Like as the textbook talks about that in years gone by, it was like, Oh, that was like used an excuse for like women in marriage that they weren't their own legal, uh, legal person in their own right because they needed protecting you know, and then oh, that's oh, oh, that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then that, that's obviously changed. You know, in years gone by, um, but then it's it, it's going to be a constantly arbitrary line that okay, we draw the line at minors and mental incapacity, but you could equally draw, you know, you could equally mount an argument for a whole range of different um, groups in society that you know should be afforded protection equally as well. Yes. And I think here we need to make, a, and you're right to make, the distinction between 
uh, minors on the one hand and everything else that might uh, affect your capacity on the other hand. Um, I think everyone would agree. I mean, whether you say it should be, you know, 16, which some, some groups advocate for, or what it is now, 18, or what it is, say, in the US, or I think it's also New Zealand, 21. Where, where you draw the line is, is arbitrary, obviously. But I guess the, the main point at the heart of that issue is you've got to protect kids. Okay, a lot of kids nowadays will look very savvy, but still make some really stupid decisions. You know, they will look like they can understand a transaction, but whether they actually appreciate all of the nuances and the consequences that flow, it remains to be seen. So I think there is a solid case for protecting kids. Even when they appear to be very street smart, I think, uh, you know, you need to have that. Um, and it's always going to be arbitrary when the kids, you know, like, uh, 17 and a half you know <laughs> it's going to be a fairly gray line to, to draw and isn't that the wonderful thing about law you know it is that gray line um so i think there's a solid case there i think where you're talking about people with a mental incapacity i think the way that the courts have stopped it being abused really is because there's such a high bar to actually be able to use mental incapacity to get out of a contract. And I think that that's where the court has kind of, you know, given that um, backstop, if you will, so that, you know, you're not going to get every Tom, Dick and Harry arguing mental incapacity and trying to back out of a contract. I do think you're right in that it is, you know, there are those grey areas. And I certainly think that um, some of them don't really stand in today's modern society like the, the married women one. Um, but I think that there is a case for some protection of, of some. It will, it will seem quite black and white at one end where you've got a child of, say, you know, six or seven. Uh, equally, it'll seem quite black and white where you've got a mentally incapacitated person that can't even attend to, you know, one of the cases says, you know, they can't even attend to the most basic of their bodily functions. So, you know, there will be clear cases, but then it's all going to kind of wonderfully meld into that shade of grey that we love and, that you know, gives us some billable hours. Okay, so that's the whole rationale. And um, what's the go with minors? Because they're the two main ones I wanted to focus on tonight, given the, um, you know, given the focus of the tutorial problem. Uh, the two main, we have, what about the mental incapacity of someone, oh, sorry, Maddie, someone who knows what they're doing, but is not in the correct frame of mind doing so? Uh, we will talk about that in about two minutes. <laughs> nice segue, Matt. I'll pay you later. Um, minors. Can we just quickly cover off minors? What's the go? What's the general position if you're going to contract with a minor? Our contracts generally enforceable or are contracts generally not enforceable? If they're enforceable, fine. Aha, no, uh, necessary. Yes, Megan, has to be, an, that is one of the classes, yes. Generally unenforceable, yes. Not binding, yes. Has to be necessary, yes. So generally speaking, if you contract with a minor, you're taking a risk. <laughs> Necessary to life support. I'm sorry, I just had a mental image of someone on actual life support there. <laughs> I know what you mean. I know what you mean. General rule is that contracts, woo, don't know why I'm shouting at you, contracts, why be binding against the minor, but can the minor enforce them against the other party? Yes, 
yes. Now we can enforce against the adult. Okay, the exceptions. Don't you love this? General rule, and then there's all these exceptions. That's the way lawyers love to work. Exceptions. One, people have already said it. Necessaries. And two, and this is, I'm talking about the exceptions where the contract will be binding, okay? If they fall into these classes, the contract will be binding. So necessaries and, aha, thank you, Megan and Steph. Uh, beneficial contracts of service, which is a fancy way of saying employment contracts. Okay, if we are looking at the issue of necessaries then, what is the test that, well, there's, it's a two-pronged test actually, isn't it? Not marriage, minors can't get married generally. Ooh, um, yes, they can, strangely enough. <laughs> minors can actually get married. Um, so the test for necessaries, it's the two prong test. Goods have to be capable of being necessary. And that is, ha ha, who had just jumped in then? Was Sorry, that, that was me. Amy, Amy? Tammy Lee. Tammy Lee. Yes, the goods have to be capable of being uh, considered necessary. Now, this is a question of what for who? Question of fact or law? Tammy Lee was going to have a punt there. Go on, Tammy Lee. Law, law, fact, fact. I've got a split decision. I think, I think it's got to be, um, it, it's law, maybe. Yes. Say it with confidence. Say it with confidence. It's law. It's law. Better, <laughs> better to be wrong and really confidently wrong. <laughs> Question of law for the judge. Okay. So they have to say, mm, what is this kind of thing? Uh, is it one of the class of kinds of thing that are capable of being considered a necessary? Aha. Uh, Amy Lee has gone on again. The onus is on the person trying to, yes, Megan, the onus is on the person trying to unpick the contract for lack of capacity. Uh, so uh, the second of the two prong tests is that the goods have to be what? Aha, thank you. Oh, sorry. People having trouble seeing my screen. Is that a bit better? Necessary in the circumstances. Okay, and this is a question of what for who? Delivered in a fair price. Oh yes, that's sale of goods. Under the sale of goods legislation. Yes, Ashley, you're right. Aha, Megan says, question of fact, for the who? Judge? The Before jury. That, aha! Didn't take my my bait there. That was wrong bum steel, wasn't it? Question of fact for the jury, that's right. So what are the kinds of things that you might show uh, to try and prove that uh, they were necessary in the circumstances? It has to be something that they can't readily obtain or they don't have a lot of already or they don't have the means to get it already if that makes sense yes exactly beneficial contracts of service that's a little trickier isn't it what's the general i'm, I'm not going to go into that in a whole heap of detail because it doesn't it's not directly relevant to the two problem but beneficial contracts of service, we also have a two-prong test there, don't we? Well, we have a we have a test, but it's mm, a little different. It's 
not really two prong, but it's does it benefit the miner? Are there too many onerous terms? Therefore, not the overall thing. Yep. So they'll look at the whole of the contract. So in the videos, this is where I went through the PT button, the Barnum case. It needs to benefit both parties. Well, it will usually benefit the employer because they'll be getting some labour. Uh, but generally speaking, when you are talking about a contract with a minor, the court's focus will very squarely be on the benefit to the minor because the contract will only be binding if it is a beneficial contract of service. It's saying that a minor is still an independent, a dependent, sorry, they don't need a job if the parents can support them. Ah, most, that's a good point, Maddie. And um, in this day and age, that's correct. However, most of this case law comes from the 1800s when kids were scratching around and often on the street with no mum and dad and no means to support themselves. So, you know, if they did get a contract of service, it was considered to be beneficial for them. It's a bit different now to where, you know, like my 13 year old wants to apply for a job at Brumbies. Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit different. Most of these cases will hark from uh, the days of yore. So it would be in the best interest of the courts possibly to review the laws and change them then? Like if they're still going off cases and laws based on the 1800s? Um, look, I'm not so sure that that's the case because there will be many... Uh, many contracts that um, miners will enter into in terms of part-time work and so forth. Um, I don't generally see a problem with making those enforceable. Um, but there is certainly a, a stack of legislation that does have a bearing in that area of law, which we won't kind of dally into because, um, as I said, it's not a real focus of the two problem. But there is um, legislation that does bear on the issue of employing minors and, uh, you know, obviously minimum pay and all of that stuff. Um, but there are, you know, quite a number of minors out there that want to have a contract of service. Like, you know, my 13 year old, she has to wait till she's 14. But, you know, that, I don't see that it's too much of a problem. Uh, the general principles, I think, are correct, which is if it does benefit the minor, then, hey, it should be enforceable. And they still, uh, jobs, I've got a 13-year-old and my 16-year-old's been working since he was 13 and my 13-year-old just got a job at Kmart. They, they can't wait. But I still, I still think it benefits them in a lot of ways. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, it's really, yes. it's taught them so much. I think it's imperative. Yes, and look at people like um, McDonald's and, and KFC and, and Macca's, you know, if, if all of their contracts with minors, <laughs> if they were... Uh, they were Big Macs. Yeah, <laughs> they, they would have a very uncertain contractual base for most of their workforce. Um, so I don't, I don't generally think that the principles are, are awry. I just think that the, uh, the, the relative importance of this area of law has probably dropped away as kids, you know, don't actually need to work for a living so much as they used to. Um, okay. Let, let us then look at, very briefly, the idea of, okay, so if it doesn't, if it doesn't fit into uh, the idea of being a necessary or, a, sorry, that's my dog going off there. And um, if it's not a necessary and it's not a beneficial contract of service, uh, there are some other types of contracts that might be binding unless repudiated. And I just wanted to flag this for you. So you have the exception where contracts are binding. Aha, I have hit the chat box is going off. Repudiated. Land sales, shares, property, woohoo! So it is a 
proprietary interest is involved or continuing obligations. So land is a proprietary uh, interest. Uh, leases are a proprietary interest. Um, shares are a proprietary interest. Partnership agreements will be continuing obligations. So all of those kinds of contracts will be binding unless repudiated. Now, I hope you watched the video bit on the difference between void, voidable, <laughs> terminated. <laughs> Please tell me yes. <laughs> Who did? Can I have? Yes, for I did and I'm fabulous. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Yay! Because you're going to need that baby for contract B, let me tell you. And once you get it straight in your head, and particularly if you get it straight in your head from the get-go, like from contract A, you're going to sail through contract B like you would not believe. I still have some people, you know, they find it hard between void and voidable. Oh, yeah. Oh, Jackson, you can catch up, no problemo. Um, it is hard, you know, when you get towards the end of contract B and then you've still got students saying to me, oh, what's the difference between avoid contract and avoidable contract? Because it really, once you get to the pointy end and you're starting to talk about, you know, remedies and all of that stuff, um, breach, damages, you really have to know your stuff in terms of, uh, you know, void, voidable, terminated. Good, so you people at home, please, if you haven't done so, uh, this is a shameless plug to go and watch that bit of the video. Um, okay, the other thing is mental incapacity. All right, mental incapacity. What's the go there? What's the general rule here? A contract's binding, not binding. Does that cover in top? Yes, it does, Jackson. Yes. Uh, mental uh, incapacity covers a stack of stuff. Uh, it might be just a genetic predisposition that causes the in incapacity. It might be a temporary illness that causes the uh, incapacity. It might be something like uh, drink or drugs. Okay. Binding unless evidence is provided. Yes, so contracts will... Now, the exception, exception, and now this is a two-prong test as well. Contract, oh, how's that for a typo? Contract will not be binding. And someone, I think it was Amy Lee, said yes, the onus is on the party alleging the incapacity yeah unless you can prove someone has taken advantage of the mess yes so the jackson that is absolutely correct and they have to be aware of what they're getting into they have to understand what they're entering into the terms of the contract and everything the per the person yeah. who possibly has the incapacity yes so the, the first Part the first prong of the two prong test is goes to level of incapacity, doesn't it? So you either understand it or you don't understand it. And where is the cutoff point? It will be uh, binding if you understand what, and it will be not binding if you don't understand what. It, tell me either one; it doesn't really matter. Uh, complexity does actually, yes, Amy Lee. Complexity does come into play. They need to be aware of basic terms. Yes, Steph. So uh, the contract will not be binding if the party does not have an understanding of the basic nature of the transaction deal arrangement. Yep. So you don't have to know, don't have to know all the fine detail but you do have to understand the basics now as amy lee said this will depend to some extent 
on just how complex the deal is. Because a person might be have a, a, an affliction with mental incapacity and they may be able to understand some uh, basic deals, you know, sale, purchase. Um, they may not be able to understand deals like, you know, a complex joint venture agreement, okay? So it will depend on whether they understand the basic nature of what it is they're doing. That's your first prong. Okay, your second prong is what? The contract will not be binding if the party doesn't understand the basic nature and yay! Amy Lee, Lee, yes, yes, Lauren. So awareness. So I'll put up here level of incapacity. And the other one, awareness of incapacity. The other party to the transaction must know of the, uh, hmm, of the mental incapacity. Yes? So it sweeps in that element of naughtiness almost, doesn't it? It sweeps in that element of, hang on a minute, someone's actually trying to take advantage here and uh, that is you know typical in this area of law that's kind of paternal protective uh, viewpoint okay case law hit me with it let's go back to minors case law nash and inman ha -ha. love it nash inman can we go through the facts of that a little bit? It's about the, the guy who was going to Cambridge and he went and ordered 11 fancy waistcoats. <laughs> Sorry, I laugh at that every time I've been teaching contract law for like 18 years. I still, sorry. Um, so the, uh, the seller's traveller found out student was <laughs> spending money pretty liberally <laughs> the word had got out uh, sold him uh, 11 fancy <laughs> sorry waistcoats in nine months I think it was <laughs> very short amount of time sold them bond uh, judge found these weren't necessities. <laughs> yeah, funny that. <laughs> um, so let's tease that out though. I know you kind of want to skip to the end. Um, okay, so in this particular case, we have a sale of clothing. So in terms of clothing, it is capable of being a necessary, isn't it? One month would have been more reasonable. <laughs> uh, it depends if you're a Kardashian. I think one week they'd go through 11 fancy waistcoats. Um, it was capable of being a necessary. So what, what was the facts here that said uh, to the court, no? The father came in and said that he had clothes? Yes. They said that you need to look, amongst other things, and this is kind of useful, you have to look at one's station in life as to whether it's actually uh, so here yeah, on the question of actually a necessary you have to look at one's um, station in life and the surrounding circumstances so I'm just looking here this is the first question was it capable of being a necessary yes it's clothing actually a necessary you've got to look at the station in life uh, and the father, you're absolutely right. Father proved, firstly, the uh, fact of um, the son being a minor, and secondly, that he had an adequate supply of. Now, that was uncontradicted evidence. And so they said there was no way a jury could have found that it was actually a necessary. There is an interesting, interesting, what I call a bookend case. And I'm not sure whether it goes 
whether the um, text goes into this case um, here I'll just do a little copy and paste and let's just see what you think of this case again uh, very very early case so Nash and Inman was 1908 and Peters and Fleming was 1840 so much earlier again I like this, one. Is this, is, this, this one was hilarious student at Cambridge again though yeah what is, what is they're, all, they're all crazy <laughs> Um, buying up again, what was it in this circumstance? It was a watch chain, rings, and a pin to secure his coat. Uh, contract. This one, I found this one interesting, AJ, because they deemed it necessary, number one, because they said he was a, a young man going to Cambridge and whatnot. But also underlying that was his father was quite, because he was of high standing, they said it was also necessary because the son should also basically live up to what, because his father was quite well off and whatnot, that he needed these things so he could stay up to that standing himself. Yes, exactly. So you've really got to scout around in the facts, don't you? Because that's exactly what a court is going to do. So it's interesting. This is what I would call almost a perfect set of bookend bookend cases you've got one holding one one case holding one way one case holding the other way what's different it all comes down to the facts and this is why case law is so super important for contract law because if you're going to argue one way you need to know the case that goes in your favor if you're going to argue another way you need to know that case and you need to be able to compare your facts with the facts of the case that you want to rely on okay so you need to be able to pull out some facts there and say in this particular case these were the facts at hand and then similarly here uh, we have this fact and this fact and this fact which is similar to the case I've just been discussing and so therefore it appears that it would be likely a court would hold similarly to the case that you've just uh, cited that's what you tend to do in to, 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 to do in a good IRAC okay in contract law anyway so there's your case law there that's going to be useful for the tutorial. In terms of mental incapacity, what's the case law we need to be getting across here? There's a couple of cases here that are also, um, also useful. Gibbons and Wright. Blomley and Ryan. I love Blomley and Ryan. Yes, it has some excellent principle, although this particular tube problem doesn't involve any intoxication, more's the, more's the pity. Uh, maybe, maybe Jenny could be both drunk and have a depressive illness. Maybe that would make it a bit more interesting. Hart and O'Connor, they are the ones I am looking for. If you're wondering why I'm looking at it this way, sorry, I've got your chat box over here and I've got you guys over here. So yeah, just bear with me. I'm not used to working with two screens. It's all a little bit uh, much for an adult brain. So given some right, what were the facts in given some right? Hit, hit me with it, peeps. Given some right. These, these are the lovely old sisters. Yeah, so it was three sisters. Uh, they had an existing agreement where uh, they were all going to get all, it was basically last man standing to, to inherit a house. Um, and the last one to die would, would get the house. Uh, they, at some point, they changed the agreement um, to some sort of agreement that I forget the name of, where they, instead of it being last man standing, they'd each just get a third share, a yeah. one third share. Um, and uh that's what they did um but then the last man standing said oh hang on we didn't know that that's what was going to happen um but it was found that the even though they didn't have capacity or the they didn't understand then they ought to have known the, the nature of the agreement 
um, as it was explained to them. So tough luck. Yes, two, two sisters were mentally incapacitated and they died. Uh, last sister, her name was Bessie, wasn't it? I love it, Bessie. Uh, she took action because she wanted the whole property, not just her share, her one third share, in fact. Now, Steph's saying, this, this confused me. Given the High Court agreed they lacked mental capacity, but the sisters or their reps didn't want the contract voided. I find odd because doesn't the family of the deceased benefit? So obviously they wouldn't want the deed void. That's exactly right. That's, you're right, Steph. So what happened was uh, the two sisters died and their shares would notionally then go to their respective estates. So then you have... Uh, is, a joint tenancy is like one, one whole pen, okay? Uh, each party owns, owns a, a share and then when they die, the other party gets their share. So the holding of the property stays uh, as one lump bundle, if you will. Uh, that's a joint tenancy. And so the last man standing gets the benefit where you have a tenant in common, you have effectively the estate of, of the, once that person dies, their estate will get that share in the property. So instead of the property being all held by one person at the end of the day, you will have the property being segmented and their shares in the property uh, going down to the various different estates of the people that held the shares in the property. Um, that can cause some real problems, um, particularly in intellectual property law, which um, I teach, shameless plug, do the elective. Um, but here, what Bessie wanted was obviously the whole of the estate. What the heirs and, and um, executors of the other sisters estates wanted was for them to keep their share of the estate okay so they they didn't want that deed to be set aside at all it was Bessie that wanted the whole of the property and she wanted that deed to be set aside okay now the first prong of the test clearly was satisfied wasn't it the second prong was that you have to be uh, aware of the mental incapacity, okay? Now, we, there's not a whole lot of discussion on that in the case, but the problem is whether or not that, um, that element had been satisfied, the issue was that the person that can set aside the contract for their lack of mental incapacity has to be the person that signed the document that's causing the problem, okay? So because the executors of the other two sisters wanted to keep their shares, there's no way they're gonna complain about that deed that gave them their share, are they? It's Bessie that's trying to do the setting aside, but she wasn't the one that was mentally incapacitated. So can you see, you have to be the person that has, is suffering the problem for you to be able to allege a lack of mental incapacity. So unless Bessie had convinced her sister's estates to try and unpick that deed, it never would have succeeded. That action wouldn't have succeeded. And I think you'll understand that a little more once we do privity at the end of term. What if the... Um person that signed the deed has, for argument's sake, Alzheimer's or something, and they do it under the um, mental capacity of like them having onset dementia, and then they get there and they don't remember it, and the family can see that it's um, not benefiting the contract that whatever was signed isn't benefiting them anymore. Can the family then try and get them out of that due to the 
person having Alzheimer's or dementia or is it still up to them to reclaim their memory and be like, I don't want this anymore? No, that's a very good question. Um, so long as those two elements were satisfied at the time of contract, so you had the mental incapacity, so maybe you might have signed a, an enduring power of attorney uh, in favour of your daughter and your daughter had been taking care of your day-to-day -day affairs because you were so uh, incapacitated with the Alzheimer's. Uh, if you went ahead and made a contract at that point, uh, then you're going to satisfy the first prong, aren't you? Because you've got this lack of mental incapacity. It's demonstrated. Uh, someone else is already acting for you in your daily affairs. You need to be able to show that the other party was aware. And as long as you can show those two, uh, even if you're still men mentally incapacitated afterwards, your, for example, in my scenario, uh, your uh, power of attorney can step in and uh, say, hang on a minute, there was this problem with capacity when this contract was signed. So same way in Gibbons and Wright, uh, the beef was really that uh, the executors of the two uh, sisters that had passed away were not doing anything to unpick that contract. They could have, but they decided not to. Okay, but that's a good question. Okay, uh, what's the other one? Someone mentioned it, the other case here I'm looking for, Hart and... Hart... Yes, lovely, 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 lovely. All right. And let's just briefly traverse the facts of this one. Look at all those different fonts. How terrible of me. Sorry, I'll fix this up before I put this up online. What was the story there? Dear old Mr. O'Connor. What was wrong with him? Ideas? Unsound mind, land sale, old and unsound mind, yes. I think it was 85, wasn't he? 83, 85, mm -hmm. he well into his 80s. And he sold property, okay. Now, this ties into what Maddie just said, in fact. So, uh, his brothers try to set a contract aside acting on his behalf yeah so that feeds into the point that you were making Matty uh, to uh, Mr Hart okay so went to the Privy Council and what did they say contract binding contract not binding at first they said not binding but yeah. then it changed, they, it got overturned because Mr. Hart wasn't aware that there was an incapacity at the time. Yes, you're right, absolutely. And Jackson is also right, and Lauren. Um, yeah, so here we have uh, the purchaser was not aware at the time of the contract of Mr. O'Connor's incapacity. So he failed on the second element. I don't understand this case. Where is equity in all of this? Um, I think, are you saying that this, the actual result in that case is not really what it should have been? Yeah, so yeah, I guess that's, I'm looking at back in the old times and then we go to now and you go, well, how is this fair if, you know, this bloke is, you know, not all there, enters into a contract and his brothers might have power of attorney or something like that and said, hey, no, no, he was, you know, a bit loony or whatever. And then the court goes, no, oh, well, um, you know, it would be unfair to, you know, take away the land sale. You know I mean? I, I look at it and go, well, how does it, how does equity sit in all this? Um, I think to answer that, we need to go with our gut, really, and to go back to the general rationale. If he is of unsound mind, um, that's one thing. But there is no 
there is no real naughtiness here that allows the courts to step in and um, protect the old fella because the person that was receiving the benefit of the sale, which was the purchaser, you know, getting the, getting the block of land, um, he didn't do anything that would uh, be inequitable. And remembering also the way that we were talking about when we were looking at theory, you know, a contract law is generally at pains to do everything on an objective basis, not a subjective basis. So if what you've got to do is look around in the facts and say, hmm, what would a reasonable person here conclude? Well, if the old fella's, you know, looking like he's on his game, um, then you've got to say, well, the contract should be able to stand unless there is a reason for it to be tipped over. And there was, in this case, no reason for it to be tipped over. There was no knowledge, no awareness. Otherwise, it would mean that basically for every contract, uh, even when a, a party you know, looked the part, looked like they had the mental goods, uh, you'd have to actually go and do a forensic examination to make sure they were right in the head. You know what I mean? Uh, it would destabilise the foundation of contract themselves if they could be torn up. Yes, exactly, Damien. Yeah. You have to, bearing in mind that the principles the courts develop have to be of general application, you know, and uh, I think generally in terms of a, a broader view, I know that you can feel a bit like, oh, it's a bit unfair that this old fella got his land taken away from him in some sense. I can certainly understand your, your reasoning there. But if you take a step back and instead of looking just at this set of facts and you abstract it and say, what are the implications if we allow this fella to hang on to his land? Uh, I think that the right decision was reached in that case. That's just my view. We can debate that, if you like, in the forums on Moodle. <laughs> um, okay, so if we look now back at the problem, we've got all the equipment now that we need to go through and uh, answer the, the, the problem. Gladys, expert seamstress, owns a fashion store in the city, specialising in evening dresses. She's in the middle of formal season, has a rush of orders from young women. Neem comes in, age about 17, very excited about her high school formal. Usually she was shopping with her mum, but she makes some excuses there. She's on her own, uh, tries on dresses, gets her to slightly alter it and says, yep, that's the one I want and pays cash on the spot. Uh, Jenny is a little older, maybe in her 20s. Uh, she says that she's a competitive ballroom dancer, needs a competition dress, buys one that's worth $2,000, uh, has to be ordered specially from the US. Uh, Glennis says that she'll let her know when the dress is in. She's paid a deposit. So she hasn't paid in full, she's paid a deposit. Two weeks later, Neve arrives to collect her dress. Her mum's with her and says, no, 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 I don't want Neve to have this dress and she demands a refund. Okay, she points out Neve's a minor, and uh, Glenna says, mm, okay, I'm gonna go and see my lawyer about that. Then she gets the phone call from Jenny, saying that she suffers from, oh, that's not laughable at all, um, suffers from a depressive condition. It's just the, I'm trying to mentally figure out how I can use all of this stuff in my own problem writing for your assignments. Um, suffers from a depressive condition and that she had been without medication when she visited the store. She stated she'd be unable to pay the $1,800 outstanding and didn't wish, wish to proceed on the contract. Glennis was very unhappy because she'd already paid the supplier. Okay. So, let's go. Second problem sort of goes into what I was asking before. Like she went in knowing what she wanted um, with the mental capability of doing it and then realised when she came out of her... Depressive state. Mania. Mm. Um, she, oh, shit, I've done something that I shouldn't have done. Mm. Mm. Yes, exactly. 
So we know that the problem here immediately with Neve, what's the problem with Neve? We're issue spotting here, folks. This is what you will be doing in terms of your assignment, but I just kindly flagged for you. The minor. Uh, yeah, exactly, minor. And the problem with uh, Jenny? Capacity. Yes. Generally speaking, is depression the kind of issue that would make you not understand a basic, the basic nature of what you're doing? Uh, I don't think so. Anyway, there's an off the cuff mark there. Not depression itself, but. Um, no. Borderline that have like mood, mood disorders, so like mania, um, depressive episodes. Me. Mm. Or the fact that she's been without medication, um, mm. that that can also call cause issues of itself, cause complications if you just go off your medication cold turkey. So that may have been part of the, the issue there. Um, or as um, Amy Lee has said, you know, uh, it may well be that she doesn't just have a depressive condition. In fact, she may well have made up the whole thing about her being a boring dad, so we don't know. Um, so we have spotted the issues, haven't we? So in our issue section, sorry. So need and issue two, two is Jenny. So the issue here is whether Renis can uh, enforce the contract with me, given that uh, Neve appears to be a minor, about 17. Okay, the issue here for Jenny Or some such. This is just you know quick, quick and dirty here. Rules. Let's take it one at a time, okay? Rules. What are the rules that we're going to state for uh, Glennis against? It's not against Glennis and Neve. when it comes to entering contracts? Yes. However, contracts are binding if they are for... Necessaries. Yay! I'm a really slow typer, that's why I keep talking, I apologise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I'd be answering questions from three questions ago if I was doing the chat box. Peter's and uh, how do you spell that again? I'm hopeless with this stuff. Peter's and Fleming. Okay. Uh, now, uh, the test, test is two prong. And then we have our two-prong test. We can just copy that, can't we? Goods have to be capable of being necessary and goods have to be actually necessary. This stuff would all go into your rules section. Okay. Uh, and then you'd probably uh, go ahead and start your application. So in terms of your application, how would you start that? Uh, now, actually, one thing we would probably say here: the onus is on is on who? Who has to prove what? Nine has to prove, or whatever her name is, has to prove that it's necessary. 
Yes, it's it's on the party alleging uh, uh, lack of capacity. So yes, lack of capacity. Uh, so here, so here, me. as they as the father did in um, Nash. Okay, so in relation to the first element. What what were the goods that were sold? Are they are they capable of being? What was it? Dress for formal. Formal clothes are capable. Clothes are capable of being a necessity. Yeah, but I guess in general they it is. But whether oh, it's an actual right. formal dress. Yes, as a question of law, clothes are generally capable of being a necessity. So it's really, uh, you'd, you'd be doing, you'd be citing Nash, wouldn't you? Um, in uh, Nat, ah, Nash's case, uh, the clothing at issue was fancy waistcoats. So what you're doing here is you're just saying to the marker, hang on a minute, I'm not just saying this, I know what the facts were in Nash and Eamon and I know what type of clothing uh, was involved. Neve, yes I know. Huh, I know it is, and I say Neve and then I say Neve and then I say Neve and then I say Neve. Um, okay, in relation to the second element, uh, were the was the dress a necessary in this? So here you might drop in what are the things that you need to look at that we said up here. We said. Uh, you need to look at things like their station in life or whether they already have an adequate supply. So it could be argued that if she didn't already have a formal dress, that it was a necessity because she needed it to be able to attend the formal. Yes. That is true. I, I think also, I was thinking though, in Nash where it says, um, he was not at the time otherwise sufficiently provided with that things of that things of that sort. The mum wasn't against getting her a formal dress. She was just against getting her that particular formal dress. So it's not to say that the mum wouldn't have bought her another formal dress. So it was just the fact that she didn't like the fashion sense of the daughter because it might have been a bit risque or whatever. But possibly the mum wasn't against any kind of formal dress. So she could have quite possibly had access to another formal gown, just not that particular one that she purchased because the mum didn't like that particular gown. But she's doing a exchange. What was that? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Sorry, demanding a refund, not saying let's look at something else. The mother's just saying, no, no give That's the money right. back. That's right. That's right, yeah. So I, I would have, in, in my IRAPA, I was saying maybe that would, could be something that um, Glennis could suggest to try and As get around, way. to get around it. Offer her an exchange. Yeah. Yeah, that's certainly, and you know what, I like that, Tammy Lee, because you're thinking outside the box and that's what we need to do. Um, often it's really easy as first year law students to just get really fixated on what our legal rights are and, you know, <laughs> everything else be damned just take the take the argument to court um, and often the best way is not to take the argument to court at all uh, and it is to suggest more uh, conciliatory measures first so uh, I think that's definitely worthwhile suggesting to Glennis um, because both parties then benefit so then Glennis isn't out and then the mum and the daughter are not overly unhappy either because she'll I guess she'll still end up with a gown and then Glennis will still end up with a sale 
Yes. And you know what? In I think that that's great. In an assignment scenario, though, what you need to... Um, what you need to bear in mind is that the marker is looking for the legal issues. So if you wanted to impress the marker, and I love it when students do this, it's fine. Um, just pop something like that into the footnote and then carry on in the body of your work answering the, the actual legal the issue. The legal side of it, yeah, fair enough. That we need to cover off. Um, so here, what would you be arguing? Formals are optional. So, uh, Glenis would uh, raise issues like formals aren't. Jackson saying uh, a necessary, yeah, optional. What else? I'd be saying uh, raise the issue of whether Neve uh, had any other such dresses that she could, could wear. And why do I do that? Because they raised that exact argument in Nash and Inman. Okay. So then you'd be saying in Nash's case, Similarly, the father proved that <coughs> uh, uh, so the, in Nash's case, the father proved that the son already had that kind of clothing and a sufficient supply. Here, if um, Glennis uh, no, here, Ginny already had sufficient formal, formal gowns. Her mum might argue the same. Thoughts? Why would Glennis be raising the issue that formals aren't necessary if she's trying to get the sale of a necessary item? Formals, that, ah, yeah. Yeah, I was typing on what Jackson had put into the thing there. Well, what's the, okay, tell me, what's the, what's the converse argument there? Well, according to schools, um, you need formal dresses to attend, so they're, they're a, necess a necessity to gain access to it. Um, but on the other hand, they are optional. I didn't go to my formal, um, so I didn't therefore need a tuxedo. I didn't have, it, it wasn't a necess necessity to go into a store and buy one. Yeah. Oh, someone lost audio? Can you hear me? Can you hear me, guys? Can I have a yes? Oh, good, 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 good. Okay. Um, so depending on the way that you argued, and I, I think this is quite arguable one way or the other, um, you could argue, mm, I think that it's, you know, I think it's a necessary. Mm, maybe it's not necessary if she already had sufficient formal dresses. Um, I personally would say that a formal dress is is necessary because it's you know it's an important rite of passage, and I personally would probably come down on the side of uh, yes, it would be enforceable. Um. Okay, if, however, that argument um, uh, is that it's not a necessity, it means that the contract would not be enforceable, okay? And Neve's mum could repudiate, 
okay? Now, whether or not she could get her money back would depend on whether there was a total failure of consideration as the text goes into. But we won't worry about total failure of consideration right now too much. Can an adult repudiate on behalf of an unwilling minor? <laughs> yes, I think they probably can because they would be your uh, legal guardian. That's certainly what happened in Nash. The minor was willing. Well, the minor was willing in Nash also, weren't they? <laughs> oh, good on you, Amy. You, you're back with us. So you'd want to argue your case. Case, if you think Glennis would have a decent argument that it's a necessary, and I think there are arguments both ways, uh, then advise. I think on the basis of uh, potentially something like that Peters and Fleming case, Uh, if you look at what was, um, you'd be pulling um, out there the facts. Ring, uh, it was a coat pin, uh, and it was something else, wasn't it? A watch, I think. A watch, yes, and I think certainly the coat pin and the watch were necessaries uh, for the station in life of the minor, it was a necessary. So here you'd be saying formals require a certain uh, level of clothing. T-shirts won't be possible. Yeah, why is the mum getting upset? I would imagine that it's the uh, <laughs> Revealing nature of the yeah the re <laughs> the revealing nature of the clothing. Okay, very quickly then, let's look at mental incapacity. Here you'd be saying the application. You'd be looking at your test here of. I'll just copy and paste from what we did before. Your basic level of incapacity and then your awareness. So here we would be pulling out, so you'd be saying something like, this is our rules section, actually here I'll put that down here. This would be our rules section here and we've got our rules and you'd be citing a case like uh, Gibbons you always need to cite some form of legal authority in your rules section. A number of um, students didn't do that in their IRACs last week. Because the whole point of a rules section is to actually tell the marker what rules, what legal rules you're going to be relying on. So then you'd be saying for the first element of the level of incapacity, uh, I think Jenny, well, what do you guys think? Do you think she can understand that she's buying a dress? I think she can. Yeah, I do too. It's, it's a basic transaction. She seemed enough with it to try on different dresses and pay a 10% deposit and understand that it needed to be ordered from the US. Yes. Okay. So I think that she's going to fall down there. Um, but then I think in any event, the, so then what you'd be doing is you'd be saying level of incapacity. What I normally, the way I'm, I think IRAX work very nicely is that you state your case that you'll be relying on. And then you weave in the facts from the current case. Okay, so you'd be looking at, uh, you might be looking at, I think this is the case that really is most appropriate here because, uh, well, no, actually, Hart and O'Connor, you could discuss either. Let's go for Hart. 
because it has something a little bit more. I'm just flipping through the facts in my mind. Uh, we had clear mental incapacity was shown uh, in that uh, he couldn't understand the nature of what he was doing. Here, it, you put in givens or right. However, all you need is a basic understanding of what the deal involves. Yep. So you'd be telling me a little bit about the facts from Gibbons and Wright. Then you'd go on to say, well, of these cases, what is our case most like? Well, this is a basic transaction. It certainly seems from the facts that Jenny can understand what she's doing. She's tried on stuff. And I think that, uh, you know, we would be probably uh, safe there. I think, she would, I think Jenny would fall down there because remember the onus is on Jenny. Um, however, we would certainly succeed in terms of the second element because um, Glennis had no understanding, no understanding, no knowledge of Jenny reported. And there you would be citing obviously Hart and O'Connor. Okay. So conclusion, I think probably both interests will likely be in course. Problems? Happy? Yay! I will flesh that out a little bit for you and then pop it up online uh, so you can download it. But apart from that, it was lovely to see you all again. And if you need me, just post up something on Facey. Other than that, I need to run to contract B. So I will catch all of you lovelies next week. Bye, Thank guys. You. Bye, Bye, guys.